Hey everybody, DJ Rob the Mill Guy here. Happy Metal New Year. And like I promised in the last video, I'll be uh, summing up this year in hard rock and metal, so to speak, with my top 10 albums of 2012. And also, I'll be doing the top three singles, because some bands, they decided not to put out full-length albums this year, and who can blame them nowadays with the digital era of music, where you can just put a song on the internet, people check it out, and a lot of these bands are also going to be putting stuff out next year, especially with touring schedules, it's very busy. But I was going to start out with the first um, first part being the singles. Just focus on that and then get into albums because I'm not going to do a top 10. And trust me, it was really hard to try to figure out the top 10 great metal albums and hard rock albums of 2012 because the amount of releases was unbelievable, especially if you listen to my show last semester. And then, you know, the winter, I was even, you know, saying this whole winter that a lot of stuff coming out still is really good. So even after my show, I was still, in, I was shocked by how much good music was coming out. So the top three singles, and there's a lot of singles, and I'm sure people, I want to make clear in this video, I understand there's some bands out there I may not heard of that had great albums. If you want, respond, put your top ten albums or your top three singles. Give me some feedback about it because I can definitely understand the amount of music. It's hard. I could have overlooked some bands, but these are going to be my top three. So for 2012, the top three singles that I have picked, starting off number three, Joel Grind. He is the guitarist singer for Toxic Holocaust. At first, in Toxic Holocaust, he kind of was a one-man show, doing all the drumming, vocals, bass work, songwriting. It was really Joel Grind's project. Joel Grind then kind of had a band formed together, put out two solid albums recently, and they've done very well. And that's what Toxic Holocaust, ho, excuse me, Toxic Holocaust is about. Now, Joel Grind, though, has gone back, and he has some stuff that he's done, and he's not put it under the Toxic Holocaust label. It's called the Yellow Goat Sessions. They'll be out next year. But he has one single out that you can download if you check it out, type it in Cross Damnation. You can preview it on YouTube, I believe, too. I already paid it. It was, I think, $1 if you want to make a donation to Joel Grind. There's a website that has it. And the song Cross Damnation, though, is very in-your-face, in you know, raw thrash. You know, it's not cleaned up. It's not got all this prissy, clean production. No, it's heavy just distorted, high reverb intensity. And I tell you, Cross Damnation is the stuff that I really like and I think sets Toxic Holocaust away from the regular thrash bands that also are doing the kind of crossover mixed with hardcore punk, old new way, you know, the British Invasion of Heavy Metal, that style. And that's what Joel has. The hard work ethic in his music is extremely heavy and that is definitely a single. It came out recently but it's still, in 2012, that song to me just shows thrash and it's peak in a way and it keeps going, especially with Toxic Holocaust. And 2013, I think it's January 15th, is they're going to release the Yellow Goat Sessions. Joel says these are recordings he did. There's also going to be a vinyl for that, which I'm really excited about. Second single, I got to give a shout out to this band too. I'm wearing the shirt right now. Ghoul, they had a song come out called Kids in America. It was a pseudo cover of Kim Wilde's 80s new wave pop hit, Kids in America. Gould changing it up though, like they've done with some other songs. I, that's what I like about Gould. They will take a song that is not metal, add their own style of lyrics, thrash, and make it just killer awesome. And they change up the chorus to be instead of Kids in America, it's Kill the Kids in America, which is, hey, I think it's all. I think it's cool. And I gotta give a quick call. I got this album, Scotty Heath, Ten Crimes Records, 2012. He had some great deals. Check it out. And they had a couple albums released this year. Um, even not albums. It was a split. He did. Scotty Heath had Municipal Waste and Toxic Holocaust. Four songs. I reviewed that. That's on RockandMelzone.com. If you want to check out the review, I've talked about it. I played it on my show. So that was big. And then The Kids in America to me is a single by itself. Really did a good job. And that's on Ten Crimes, free download. Scotty Heath looking out for us fans, giving us some great music, and Ghoul too. And this is a We Came for the Dead and Maniacs compilation, 
I have. I just want to give you know a quick possible review recommendation. Solid. The first two Google albums that are just amazing, splatter thrash in your face. Number one single of 2012 though has to be I Hate Gods. New Orleans is the new Vietnam. Possibly one of the best riffs of 2012. Heavy sludge doom. Those guys I hope make a full length album because I hate God when it comes to sludge doom metal. They're on the top. When it, you know you look at the bands, they stand out the most to me. Southern, Discom Southern Discomfort was a solid album release. And New Orleans is the New Vietnam is just a heavy, sludgy, chugging riff. Jimmy Bauer is one of those musicians that just I don't know how he does it. He plays drums, guitar, he does so much and he's in Down which will be in the top 12 or top 10 best albums. I'll get into that of 2012. So, I Hate God, those are the top three singles, my opinion. There's a bunch of other singles that came out too that you should check out, look around. But that when it came to 2012, those three stuck out in my mind. Now let's get into the top 10 albums of 2012. Oh, this is really hard for me because there was a lot that came out, a lot of my favorite bands. So I'm a bit torn on this one. And I do understand people, like I brought up earlier in the video, that they'll be, hey, you forgot this band or all oh, that band should have been on there. This is mine. Everyone has their own opinions on it. But when it comes to hard rock and metal, this is my 10. This is what I really liked. Stood out to me. So starting off, number 10, Witchcraft. Legend. Solid, classic sounding Doom hard rock album. The song Deconstruction, it is maybe one of my favorite songs of 2012. I have a hard time because I, you know, there's so many good songs. But the riff, the style, very much Pentagram esque with that Bobby Liebling phrasing with the, you know, classic rock riffs. And that's what I like, that Witchcraft stands out in that sense. They have the classic rock sound from like the 70s, but it's 2012. And that's the thing, is I sometimes want bands to go back and explore that style of music from the 70s, 80s, the doomy, metal sound, Sabbathy, because when they reinvent it, it sounds just as good as if it was in the 70s. And also production values. So... A doomy pentagramish song, witchcraft, you know, back then would sound totally different than now. And that's why Legends is a solid album. It has that classic vibe to it with the modern. They're from Sweden. Go on their website, check them out. Legend, that's my number 10 pick, 2012. Moving on, number 9. I felt this band should have been a little higher. I feel I'm a little upset maybe I put them as number 9. But they still will be in the top 10, which I'm glad. And that's Gojira. They are a French experimental death band. It's so hard to categorize Gojira. Amazing musicians. And the, the album is called Les Enfants Sauvages. It's the Crazy Baby. And that album to me stood out because Gojira is extremely unique when it comes to their riffs, the timing, the vocals. Everything about Gojira is different, and there's for some reason a lot of American metal bands need to really get on this. Change it up a bit. Don't do the same thing. When you listen to Le Enfant Sauvage, that first song just is unique. The riff is so different. It doesn't follow a conventional like, dun, 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 like a breakdown. No, there's different parts to it. It combines so many different elements. The songs on that album are so diverse, and that's why Le Enfant Sauvage I feel like I should have put a little higher, but I'm going to say that's number nine. Great album from Gojira. Please check that out. Number eight. It's not an album. I kind of was thinking maybe I shouldn't have put this, but no, I have you. I was really excited when it came out. The Down for Purple EP. I just talked about Jimmy Bauer. He plays drums on this album, but you have, come on, Kirk Winstein, Pepper Keenan back making great solid riffs together and Phil and Summer being the badass that he is. I'm glad Phil's got Down going still because Down is one of those bands that's all about the riff, it's all about the attitude, it's about the power and the Down 4 Purple EP, whether it be the song Witch Tripper, Levitation, it hits you. It just the music hits you, you're enjoying it. And some people complain about the production value. 
I have to argue, the production on this is really good. And these guys, I think, were in the studio. They know what they were doing. The music sounds solid. The guitar levels, when it comes to distortion and the sound of the quality of the riffs, it's great. I mean, the, it has that heavy, sludgy doom, but a little bit of classic doom in it, which is cool. So the Down 4 Purple EP, even though it's an EP, I still consider it an album 2012. Number 7 here. John 5. God told me to. John 5, how do you do it? How do you do it? It's insane. The guy is just an amazing guitar player. He's playing with Rob Zombie right now. I still can't understand it. He makes music when it comes to guitar playing so unique. Welcome to Violence, one of the songs off that album. You listen to it, you just sit there going, how does a guy play like this? And that's just John 5 for you. He has such a versatile style. He's very original in his playing. He even steps out and doesn't just play distorted, you know, crazy guitar solo pieces. No, he does an acoustic song called It's the Night Stalker, the Casa Nochador, and it's unbelievable. He's playing acoustic Spanish flamenco guitar, but he makes it sound just brilliant. And that's what I like about John Five. He does some unique stuff. He even does a cover of Michael Jackson's Beat It instrumental. Of course, Eddie Van Halen did the original solo, so why not have another great guitar player tackle that song? And John Five just brings it. I played that on my show, and a lot of people couldn't believe it. They said, well, Beat It's not metal or hard rock. Uh, when John Five plays it, yeah, it's pretty badass. So that's why I had to give that number seven. Number six is Overkill's The Electric Age. The Electric Age is an album, I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, hmm, it was Overkill, you know, they're good, but no, Overkill's consistent. I can tell you, not one song on that album is bad. Electric Rattlesnake, when I first heard it, I said, oh, this must be a song from Ironbound, because it sounds just as good as the stuff on the last on Ironbound. No, new song, new album, they came out this year, and they're still going strong, and Overkill's one of those bands just because they're on the East Coast, I feel they get totally overlooked. People, for some reason, like to focus on the thrash metal bands on the West Coast. But no, Overkill's Electric Age is solid. It's a great album. Production value, amazing. D.D. Vernon's bass playing, I love the tone. Bobby Blitz, great frontman. That is my number six. Number five, I reviewed it. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to go, really, Robbie? But guess what? St. Vitus, Lily F65 is my number 5 album of 2012, everybody. And I have it on vinyl here. I reviewed it already, so I'm not going to get too into it. To me, what St. Vitus is doing, I just enjoy. Because they have always played Sabbath-like doom with their attitude, their style, and they keep it going. There's no stopping these guys. I hope to see them live soon. They'll hopefully be at, back out on tour this year, 2013. And I really want to see them make another album. Because that stuff in the 80s, you needed that. Because you had your hair metal, your thrash. And in 2012, an album like Lily F65 is needed to stand out. To just take that original style of heavy metal and bring it forth to the fans. And it's enjoyable music. Dave Chandler solos, Wino's vocals, and the rhythms. Done. That's number five. Number four, people might be surprised about this. They might not know a lot about this band. And I reviewed them for Hard City. It's a website I work for, reviewing. Grease, check it out, hardcity.com. And uh, they're called Skelerata. That's the band. And I'm sure a lot of people are going, really? Who? What? But no, Skelerata's The Sniper is amazing. Hands down, number four. It deserves to be number four in this band. There's so much more recognition. It's unbelievable. These guys are from Brazil, huge in Brazil, and I hope they get big in America because they deserve it. Just imagine Iron Maiden mixed with Halloween. That's what The Sniper is. Progressive power metal, that Maiden-esque triumphant feel, and oh, and guess what? They have Paul Diano, the original singer from Iron Maiden, singing on the album. Andy Durris, Halloween, he sings on the album. And not only does he sing on the album, they work together and collaborated. 
Scott Rada's writing style, amazing, heavy songs, everything flows, the choruses are powerful, the vocals soar, the drumming is intense. I interviewed the drummer, so that's why I'm giving him a shout out. Francis Casol, unbelievable drumming, guitar work. Sniper, just again, as a whole album in 2012 to me stood out because of its complete, completeness. And even though Scalarata is not a well known band and people being like, you could have put some other bands up there, guess what? No, they deserve it. The Sniper's amazing. Check it out, Scalarata. That is my number four. Getting a little, getting a little feisty and angry here. Number three, I'm a big fan of these guys. And the album they came out with is awesome. The band, of course, Melvins. And the album is called Freak Puke. And why I like the Melvins Freak Puke and why it's number three is Trevor Dunn. Simple as that. Trevor Dunn, the bass player, Mr. Bungle, Phantom Oz, Melvins, is amazing. He's an amazing musician, and when he's in the Melvins, their albums always sound great. For some reason, it just, I never understood that. Because Melvins like to change it up, I think. The lineups, they have the big business lineup, which I saw recently. It's good. I do like the Melvins and Big Business together. But for some, Trevor Dunn, when he's in the Melvins playing bass, Buzz and Dale step up their game too. And the songs on Free Puke, from top to bottom, unbelievable musicianship and quality. Production, everything sounds fine, so I'm not going to get in production. And I know a lot of people like to complain about production. No, it's great. And Trevor Dunn's style, again, the solos he does on his contrabasses, the upright, I saw him this summer. This guy is great. Why is he not getting more recognition? People, for some reason, think Flea's a great bassist. Screw Flea and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Trevor Dunn, Melvin's Free Puke is amazing. It's also referred to as Melvin's Light, but there's nothing light about it. If anything, this is Melvin's awesome, brilliant greatness. That's what I like about it. That's what people need to be listening to. Free Puke. They even cover a Paul McCartney song called Let Me Roll It. I would, I would have never even heard of this song. Personally, I don't like Paul McCartney. But the Melvins took a Paul McCartney song and made it just insanely cool that I want to learn to play it on guitar. Leon vs. the Revolution, another great song, and then Tommy Goes Berserk. The names are crazy. The musicianship is insanely brilliant and awesome. Check it out. That's number three of 2012, Melvin's Free Puke. Number two, I, for some reason, number one and two, I struggle here, people. And I know I'm going to get a lot of crap for this. A lot of comments, but hey, it, oh, it was tough. Number two is Testament, Dark Roots of Earth. Now, everyone, I know it could have been number one. But I'll talk about the band yeah, that's number one after. But to me, this album was awesome. Testament is back, doing great. Well, they've been around still. So, no, they're not just back. You have Gene Hogan on drums. Drumming's phenomenal. Alex Skolnick, that last album they had, Formation of Damnation, was heavy, was intense, the guitar riffs, that was to me just thrash metal mixed with heavy aggression. And you just wonder if there was a big five, Testament should probably go in just because their music in the last two albums is unbelievable. And this album definitely, Native Blood is a song alone to me was so powerful and Chuck Billy's vocals on that song because he I think it deals with you know he, he is a you know part Native American so it deals with he has some connection to that when I listen to that song in the car I, I, I worry that I might crash because I'm just in, so into the song the guitar playing and they even have it's not just thrash they incorporate so many other styles of metal I say that you can't just say oh Testament's a thrash band no they are a heavy metal band because their sound is so diverse sometimes, triumphant, Iron Maiden-like, then they have the thrash parts, and then sometimes they have this very, Billy, his voice soars, and it's so unique, it's even got like a like heavy growl to it. That's why that album, Dark Rose of Earth, number two, number two, could have been number one, and oh man, they had some heavy songs on that album that I just really enjoyed, and I, Personally, I'm saying it could have been number one. Testament's still going strong. And they're one of those bands that if you, for some reason, just think thrash metal and metals of, you know, Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer, Megadeth, forget those bands. 
Testament, no. These guys, for some reason, maybe I'm from the Bay Area, I'm a little biased, but hey, I'm going to say a lot of reviewers are biased. A lot of people are biased in general. I like Testament. Their, their album, number two, 2012, hands down. Number one, and I know my family and friends are probably saying, wow, Robbie, we could have seen this one coming. 2012, Rush, Clockwork Angels, everybody. Clockwork Angels. It's not the best Rush album of all time, but this was the album I was looking forward to definitely in 2012. When it came to hard rock and metal, I played this on my show. I talked about it. <sighs> yes. I'm giving this number one. Now, I will give the reasons quickly here. Songwriting. Neil Peart, this whole 2012, I listened to bands. There was some good songwriting on all the albums I've listed, and there was some other stuff. But Neil Peart just connects with the fans. He came out with a solid story. Clockwork Angels is a concept album in an era and then a decade where concept albums seem to be lost. The structure of concept albums, they're okay sometimes. They're not powerful enough. Clockwork Angels, from start to finish, is a story. It is a story that strongly expresses ideas, what Rush is going through. And some of these songs, like Caravan, there's this one part, I can't stop thinking big. Rush, they just can't stop thinking big. They keep going. Their music grows. Rush is unbelievable in that sense, that a lot of bands lose it. I'm going to name off some bands. Aerosmith, their latest album, Songs from Another Dimension, Legendary Child. It was horrible. The writing style was not strong. The vocals, I'm sorry. This album shows what guys that constantly put out material work hard. And musicianship-wise, Neil's drumming the drumming god. I'm sorry. Neil is the greatest drummer on this earth right now. Alex Lyson's guitar. Heavy, prominent, all these songs, the solos, mind-blowing. Geddy Lee's bass tone on this album, heavy. I think a lot of metal bands should listen to Geddy's bass tone and style because that's really what makes solid tracks and rhythms. And even his lyrics, I think Geddy, or not his lyrics, his vocals, Geddy's vocals on this album were great. And he's had to change it up, he can't sing as high, can't do the fly by night stuff, you know, where he hits those high notes, but still. It was a solid album in an era where for some reason people are forgetting how to make really good concept albums, I feel. And mainstream music, of course, is going to frown upon this, but guess what? Rush is still here to stay. In 2012, they're still making great music. That's what's important, everybody. These bands I listed, the top ten, they're making good music. Young, old, new, whatever. They're still making music, and hard rock heavy metal is still going to be around. It's been around for many years. Hasn't died, hasn't gone away. So that's the most important thing. Rush is, why this is number one? It stands the test of time. This album, I believe people will be talking about. Will people be talking about Lady Gaga or Nikki, whatever her name is, or Carly, what? I, I don't even know these artists. I don't even know who the hell they are. And it's 2012, I guess their songs came out or something. Gangnam Style? No, this will last forever. This is amazing music. Check it out. DJ Raw the Mail Guy here signing off. Thank you for everybody that watched this video. Next year, 2013 is already shaping up to be some great releases I've seen. Bands are talking. Albums are going to be amazing. And I'm going to be playing them on the show. The Hard Rock Heavy Metal Zone, which is on ksunradio.com. I'll have links below. Website Rock and Metal Zone. So everybody, have a happy metal new year. And remember, 2012, year for metal. But then again, every year is a year for metal. Thank you guys. See you later.